have a, a few words from Madam Secretary. We're gonna go over the approval of past meeting summary. From Dr. Wilberg, we're gonna have the model status update and small model sessions recap. We're gonna go into breakout groups for aquaculture. We're gonna have a short break. Then Dr. North and I will do the rating options, not model that we did a few months ago, complete that. We're gonna have a reminder from DNR, from Mr. Chris Judy, public comment, and then we'll adjourn. Madam Secretary. Thank you, Quinn, and good evening, everyone. I just wanted to take, take a moment. Um, I wanna be brief because I know there's a really robust agenda ahead of us tonight, um, but I wanted to take a moment to thank everyone for all of the work that has gone into the OAC so far. Um, things seem to be going really well, despite some really hard challenges that we've all been going through with the pandemic. Um, this was a hard enough task as it was, but doing it virtually is even more of a challenge. So I commend all of you for the progress that we've made. And in that vein, we would like to try to get back to in-person meetings by August. So um, please take some time to think about that if you have any concerns or um, issues with that in terms of your organizational rules, please feel free to reach out to Memo or Quinn. Um, but again, our intent is to try to start in-person meetings again in August. I also just wanted to take a second to thank everyone who participated in the special meeting earlier this month to discuss the proposed oyster regulations for the 2021-2022 season. Um, if you didn't get a chance to share your thoughts with us that evening, there's still plenty of time to submit public comment to our department. Um, thank you, Quinn, for sending out the email to everyone with the link to all of the information. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or our staff. And um, I know at the end of the meeting, Chris will provide some additional detail on how you can provide public comment. Um, but we don't need a vote from the OAC on that issue. We really just need your feedback. So please do take the time to go through the presentations, um, go through the proposed regulations and um, give us your thoughts whenever you have a chance. And with that, I will turn it back over to Quinn. Thank you, Madam Secretary. I'm gonna go over the roll before we approve last month's meeting minutes. Commissioner Bradley, are you present? Commissioner Bradley, Commissioner Brown is present, Commissioner Breyer is present, Commissioner Busick is present, Commissioner Colden is present, Commissioner Cover is present, Commissioner Cox, are you present? Commissioner Cox, Commissioner Dean is present, Commissioner Fithian, are you present? Commissioner Fithian, Commissioner Fowler, are you present? Commissioner Fowler. Commissioner Harrison is present. Commissioner Eilith is present. Commissioner Kanaki is present. Commissioner Lane, are you present? Commissioner Lane. Commissioner Leggett, are you present? Commissioner Leggett. Commissioner Miller, are you present? Commissioner Miller. Commissioner Mullen is present. Commissioner Pluta, are you present? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Commissioner Ruth is present. Commissioner Shockley is present. Commissioner Skorsky is present. And Commissioner Swanson, her proxy is present. Mr. Mark Hoffman. Commissioner Webster is present. Commissioner Waples, are you present? Commissioner Waples. Commissioner Wilkins is present. Commissioner Witt, are you present? Commissioner Witt. Commissioner Corson is present. Senator Elfrith, are you present? Senator Elfrith, Senator Hershey, are you present? Senator Hershey, Delegate Holmes, are you present? Delegate Holmes, Commissioner Judy's present, Delegate Mouse is present, Commissioner Sowers, are you present? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. The first is in order is approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. Are there any corrections to the meeting minutes? There being no corrections and minutes are approved as circulated. Our next business in order will be the model status update and small model sessions recap from Dr. Wilberg. Dr. Wilberg. 
Thank you, Quinn. Memo, can you please allow me to share my screen? Go ahead. OK, there we go. OK, um, what I want to do today is I want to go briefly over the um, uh, do a recap of the uh, three hour modeling meetings we had a couple of weeks ago with everyone. And then uh, before that, I'm just going to tell you where we are and where we're going with the modeling. Um, so uh, right now, um, we're still continuing to make progress from the model that we showed you uh, at the end of the May meeting or in the May meeting. Uh, we're going to be showing you more detailed information at the July meeting. Uh, in particular, we're working on some of the aspects that we talked about in the modeling session meetings, as well as we're trying to update the options or have some updated options based on the feedback that we've gotten uh, since the May meeting uh, to try and make those more representative of some of the options that you're all interested in. Uh, so that's the direction uh, we're headed in, and we're uh, basically going to be doing that probably the next couple of months. Um, so expect to see new results at the July meeting. So just to recap, the goal of the model overall is to try and help us understand how different options that we might try are likely to uh, perform. And so that's the whole idea is to have a tool that allows us to compare uh, different options against one another and see which ones uh, produce the most oysters, which ones produce the most harvest, which ones uh, cause habitat to increase and so on and so forth. So these are the sorts of things that we're looking at. Another aspect of the model is that we're making sure that it fits the historical data. Um, and so we estimate parameters of the model in order to allow it uh, to um, try to make realistic forecasts. And so the basic idea is that we use the time series from 1999 uh, to the present, and we use that time series to estimate parameters that allow us to forecast into the future. What that ends up meaning is that we're baking into the model that we expect the future to be similar to the last 20 years in terms of things like natural mortality rates and quality of spat sets and things like that. Um, and so that is something that um, is included, but it also means that our model is uh, realistic and that it can describe the past relatively well, at least the past 20 years. Um, and so then we use that model as a setup along with specific options to project into the future. Um, we have uh, this, all of the blue area in the Maryland waters of Chesapeake Bay is included in the, um, uh, in the model. And so we're including all these regions. And if you happen to be unmuted, if you could please mute yourself, I'd appreciate that. Um, the model had, we're modeling the oyster population at the level of the named oyster bar. And so all of the orange colored uh, shapes on this map indicate uh, individual polygons where we're tracking the oyster population. And so we're tracking the population on over 1000 locations in Maryland. And we're also tracking the shell in those uh, areas too. And so the model overall describes the oyster population, the fishery, and the bottom habitat dynamics or the amount of shell or bottom substrate. And those are all, I'm not going to go through all of those again because I want to keep this update fairly short today. Um, but I did want to come back and hit on one thing that where the, the first presentation that people got to see of it was in the small group modeling meetings. And that's the effect of fishing on the bottom on shell as well as on future spat sets. And so there have been disagreements in the OAC before about what the effect of fishing is on the bottom. And the idea is 
Uh, does fishing cause there to be more or less shell in the future? And is it beneficial or negative for future stat sets? Uh, so we did two different analyses. I'm just going to show you the one that I think is more comprehensive today. The first one that I'm not going to show you is one we've talked about before in meetings, which was uh, DNR had a study where they opened several areas to power dredging. They had a comparison site that wasn't open to power dredging and they monitored the sites that were open to power dredging and um, uh, using uh, patent tongs and have a data set from that that's about six years long. Uh, the other data that we used to look at this was the uh, fall dredge survey for Maryland, which visits about 300 different oyster bars per year. And also um, we use the harvester uh, reports, the daily reports that all watermen need to, um, need to submit when they're harvesting uh, in order to describe the amount of, of fishing that happened. Um, and so what we do is within this, we look at how much the culch that's caught in the fall dredge survey changes from one year to the next and how much the spat uh, how many spat are there the year after um, uh, the fishing happens. And so we look at this across the range of sites that are sampled in the fall dredge survey to try and understand what the effects of fishing are on uh, both the bottom and on spat set. And so I'll say up front that the, the main conclusion I draw from these analyses is that there's uh, not a detectable effect of fishing on the bottom. And that's either a positive or a negative effect. So the graph specifically that I'm showing you here um, show amount of catch per square meter on the bottom. So that's an index of how much fishing is happening in an area. Um, and then on the uh, vertical axis here, we have the change in culture from one year to the next. And this is a uh, um, a scaled version of that. And so what we end up with here is that in all cases, um, the confidence intervals, which are in the blue or the light blue and the dark blue line is the best estimate, um, that the confidence intervals all overlap zero, which indicate no detectable effect. Um, and so that's the results from this for Kulch on the bottom. And the results are also very similar for the amount of spat. Each of these um, different panels is a different gear. And so none of the gears in particular showed a, a, um, uh, what we would consider a meaningful effect. And so the, based on these analyses, we're not including an effect of um, harvest on either culture or spat in the model uh, right now. Although when I get to it, these were uh, pretty big points of discussion in all the group meetings. Uh, so we'll come back to that a little bit. So uh, just to try and summarize the discussions we had, in, in total, we had about 10 hours of meetings on this and I really, um, uh, thank everybody who participated in those. I appreciated um, the feedback from everyone and hopefully uh, you all found it useful as well. But um, uh, what, we're, what we talked about um, in the, I forgot to uh, update that. Um, so uh, this slide needs to be revised because I've forgot to finish it earlier today. But uh, um, the things that we talked about were basically about the model. The, the results I just showed you were one of the main things that were talked about. Um, and based on those discussions, we have a variety of future directions. Uh, there were several new options that were described by um, commissioners that we want to try and include. Some of them we already had some plans for, other ones uh, are fairly new. So one is to try and um, test out some different rotational harvest options. These include ones like what's currently being done in Virginia, as well as um, options that are similar to, to what's being done in the Wicomico River. Uh, and then we had a couple of other options that one was to try to um, 
model what would happen if we did restoration efforts in more than just the five restoration sanctuaries, so expand that program to other uh, sanctuaries, um, or at least some uh, form of restoration instead of uh, letting them sit fallow. And then the other option that I had in my notes from the meetings was to um, look at options that plant natural seed in the upper bay. Some of the previous ones we had were using spat on shell and so people were interested if natural seed made a difference. Um, and then the other big thing that we talked about in the meetings were what I would call critical uncertainties in in the way I describe the sort of modeling we're doing. And so there's certain things that we don't know and we're not likely to know before we have to make decisions or recommendations. And so these become critical uncertainties that we wanna try and understand if they have a strong influence on the success of the options. Um, despite the analyses that I showed, uh, there were, um, uh, quite a few comments uh, questioning how um, comprehensive the uh, estimates were of the effects of fishing on the bottom. And I'll tell you that the both analyses that we did had a variety of, of uh, problems because they use just the fishery as it happened. They, they really lack real controls. Um, and so they're not ideal for getting these estimates and there are uh, some uh, limitations with how we can interpret the results. And so there is still the potential that in some places there is a beneficial effect of fishing or a negative effect of fishing. And we don't have that uh, fully wrapped up. And so we may be able to uh, look at what um, at some options if we assume there's beneficial effects of working the bottom versus, um, versus not, and the alternative to that. I will caveat that in the past, we haven't been able to get the model to run when we include those. Um, and this is one of the things where if there were really strong effects, either positive or negative of fishing on the oyster shell itself or on uh, future spat sets, um, I expect that oysters wouldn't be in the current situation. If it were a really negative effect, um, would there wouldn't be oysters left after 200 years of commercial fishing. And if it were a really positive effect, I suspect that we'd be in a situation with many more oysters than we have now. Uh, so I suspect that the effect is still pretty small, um, uh, but that doesn't mean it's not necessarily important. Uh, so we're going to try and do some stuff with that, but I'm not exactly sure if we'll be able to get the model to run with it. And if the model doesn't run with it, what that implies is that having that effect in the model is not consistent with what's happened during the last 20 years. Uh, but we'll talk about that more, perhaps at the July meeting, perhaps at the August meeting. We'll see, um, we'll see when we uh, get that done and what we're able to actually do with it. Um, another topic that came up was what's the effect of 3D reef structure? Um, the model is uh, representing the bottom habitat of oysters as the amount of volume per unit area. We're not actually calculating a height because the only way we could do that easily in the model right now is to say that everything is spread evenly across the reef and that's not very realistic from, um, uh, from the studies that have been done uh, of oysters. They tend to be more patchily distributed. Um, and so we're going to see if there might be something that we can do on that. The effects of 3D structure might, in the literature, there's been some effects of that on oyster growth, on spat set, as well as on habitat loss. And uh, we'll see what we can, uh, potentially include as some uh, sensitivity analyses for the model. Another one was the model is relying on the fishing patterns that were seen between 1999 and 2020. 
uh, in order to describe how we expect the fishery to respond to changes in oyster abundance into the future. If there are substantial changes in the number of watermen or other management measures that are going to change the number of people who participate in the fishery, um, then our assumptions that we have in the model might not hold very well. And so we're going to try to explore something along the lines of, of uh, different ways to look at uh, modifications to fishery effort. Um, then uh, the last two uh, things we had were, there was some discussion about what the reproductive potential of market-sized oysters is in restoration sanctuaries. Right now, the model essentially says, on average, a market-sized oyster is three and a half inches. Um, if in sanctuaries oysters continue to grow and get bigger, then they would have, they would be producing more eggs, they'd have a higher proportion female, and right now the model isn't uh, representing that. It basically says, on average, all market size oysters are three and a half inches. And so um, uh, that's another thing we're going to look into, whether we can do some sensitivity analyses uh, to get at. Um, and then the last uh, topic had to do with um, the, the lost rates of habitat, and in particular, artificial substrate. And so the model is saying that in the absence of any oysters or any planting, that we're going to see a loss of both shell and artificial substrate in those systems. The estimate for shell, at least we have data for that, and we're basing our estimate on the analyses I showed you previously. The estimate for artificial substrate is more of a guesstimate in that we're simply saying it's about half of what it is for shell. Um, and that uh, is a guesstimate and we will try some different values of that to see whether or not it makes a difference for the performance of the options. My suspicion is it's not gonna make too big of a difference, but I've been wrong on these things before and that's why we need to go through the whole process of trying them out. So um, these are the ones that I have on my list um, from my notes from all those meetings. And I apologize, apologize if I missed somebody's from those meetings. Um, the last thing that we talked about, and I promise this is my last slide, is we um, looked at uh, or we talked about potential research recommendations. So as we just talked about with the effects of fishing on the bottom, um, there was more to learn about this and the results we have are not definitive. Uh, and so because of that, um, the OAC may want to make research recommendations for the future as part of the package of recommendations to highlight areas that you would like to see better understanding gained um, in the future. Uh, so the ones that we talked about in the meetings were effects of fishing on available shell and spat set, uh, what the loss rate of shell and artificial substrate is, so basically how rapidly it becomes unavailable to oysters on the bottom, and then um, the last one that I'll explain a little bit is we're going to be doing some options that involve uh, reclaiming shell on Manowar Shoals to use for efforts in other parts of the bay. And in the model right now, we only have the effects of that shell dredging on oysters and on the shell available for oysters. We don't model any of the other ecosystem effects of that shell dredging. Um, and the ecosystem effects of all the efforts are things that are difficult to capture. And we're really looking more at the uh, effects directly on oysters rather than the indirect effects on the rest of the ecosystem for most of the model. But something to keep in mind that there, there are these other effects. They're real. Um, and uh, we don't know a lot about what would happen. So I have it here as a research recommendation uh, potential. Um, so that's what I have, and I'd be happy to um, take any questions if we still have some time. Yes, Dr. Wilberg, we do. I see Commissioner Colden and then Commissioner Eilert has a question. Uh, do you want me to order the two begonias? Yes, yes please. Hold, hold. Yeah, one pot for each one. Mm -hmm. Commissioner um, Colden? It's just a, okay. 
Yeah, sorry, I was waiting for the for the mute. Um, quick question, Mike, or maybe this is for an OAC member from that county oyster committee. You said you were um, interested in rotational harvest, and one of the examples you gave was the Wicomico River, but I'm not familiar with what's going on there. Can you give a brief explanation? And I have hopefully one other question after that, if you'll allow me. Sure. Um, so right now, uh, my understanding is in the... <laughs> This is complicated because there's two Wicomico rivers in the model, but it's the one on off the Potomac on the Western shore. Um, and what they've done there is they've uh, done some plantings in areas and they've restricted harvest or they've not opened those areas to harvest. And they're trying to get enough oysters there to um, get up to critical mass before they decide to, to open them up to harvest. And so my understanding is it's been three or four years, but I'm forgetting the details at the moment. Um, but uh, that's what uh, that option refers to. Okay, and for the rotational harvest option in general, um, how are you determining the locations and uh, rotational harvest schedule? Is that something you already discussed in the small group meetings, or is that something we as the OAC need to provide recommendations on which, which areas and what schedule? Any recommendations the OAC could make are would be really welcome. Um, in the absence of those, uh, our group will come up with some straw man options to provide to you, and then um, we'll uh, ask you for feedback in ways to improve them. Um, so uh, the, the one that we did previously involved taking some sanctuaries and turning those into rotational harvest areas, but the way the model is set up, we can take areas that are already harvest areas and make those rotational or however we want to do it. The model can basically do all of those things. And I'm expecting that we would look at some version of, of those sorts of things. So kind of that's the way it's set up in Virginia is that their actual harvest areas are the ones that are in a rotation. And so we could consider that. Yeah, I just wanna thank you. I wanted to clarify that from a sort of vocabulary standpoint, rotational harvest is the term that gets thrown around in the OAC a lot and in this context has been used with respect to opening sanctuaries. Um, and I think that there's a there's a general difference in the viewpoint of what rotational harvest means and where it goes and what a sanctuary is. Um, so if there's an opportunity to um, discuss those rotational harvest area options more deeply um, in the larger group, I would really appreciate that. Yeah, I'll make sure that we have some of those options for you to see at the July meeting, and we'll um, make sure there's time to talk about them. But I, I agree, it's, it's something that there's generally been quite a bit of interest in, in looking at, and so we'll do something with that. Thank you, Commissioner Ilop had questions, and then Commissioner Harrison, and then Commissioner Corson. Hi, uh, thanks, Mike, for the presentation. So. My questions are kind of a two for a question. So you were mentioning during the like critical uncertainties uh, part of your presentation that regarding the effect of um, larger oysters on 3D reefs uh, or, or sorry, the, the three-dimensional nature of reef building that it was not in the model to account for additional oysters based on their their area, right? So like if you have 50 oysters in a square meter, they cover about X percentage of the square meter, whether they're three inches thick or a foot thick. Is that right or am I missing the point there? Um, it's, this is one of the things that's a little bit more complicated to describe. So essentially what the model is doing is it has the footprint area of each oyster reef. And then within that, it also has the number of oysters of each of the different size groups. And then it has the total amount of bottom substrate in different categories. And so the way the model is set up right now, the number of spat that can settle in an oyster depends on how much habitat or how much bottom habitat is in that, um, 
is in that uh, uh, have or that on that named oyster bar. The so the more habitat there is, the higher on average it should be off the bottom, and that will result in more spat set. Um, but we're not specifically saying, okay, this oyster reef is three inches off the bottom versus this one over here is two inches off the bottom. Just it, there's a couple of different things. One is because of the heterogeneity of the habitat within these really large areas, the named oyster bars are very large. Um, it ends up being challenging to do that. We tried to do some stuff with it early on, but decided we had to put it on the back burner and we couldn't come up with a solution in time for this process. Um, and the other thing is that uh, right now the model is capturing those effects by basically saying, let's say you have 50 bushels of shell on a reef. It's saying, the model is saying that those 50 bushels of shell are going to attract the same number of oysters, whether they're all in one big pile or whether they're spread out evenly across the bar. Um, and so that's the assumption that's being made in the model is that the kind of the shape of that doesn't matter. Um, I recognize that that's not entirely true, uh, but it's, it's one of our, our model assumptions. And we'll, like I said, we'll try and see what we can do to uh, make some alternative runs with it, but hopefully something in there answered your question. Yeah, it, basically the encapsulation that the shape of the reef, if you have a certain number of oysters, is not it being accounted for. That that is what I was wondering, yep. and and that kind of dovetails nicely with the other question that I had in that same uh, section, or or no, I guess it wasn't the same section, but either way, the model assuming that all market oysters are three and a half inches and not accounting for the increased fecundity of a larger oyster that might exist in a sanctuary. Um, it seems like, and, and you mentioned that is something that merits further scrutiny and study, um, but that we probably won't have an answer for before the report that the General Assembly requires of us is due, right? Um, it's that sort of the dynamic of having oysters continue to grow bigger as the sanctuary gets older is difficult to model within the framework we've set up. Um, the original framework for the model that we tried to set up had more uh, sizes that oysters could have, so it would have allowed it, but that model ended up taking several days to run and it was going to be too long to do for this process. So we kind of abandoned it in favor of the simpler version. Uh, what I'm proposing that we're going to do is, um, is to go back and look at the monitoring data from the sanctuaries and get an idea of what the actual average size of oysters is in those sanctuaries. We have several um, areas that are now, I think seven or eight years old um, in terms of uh, the oysters that are there. And so given that information, we'll try plugging in some different values for what the average size of a market oyster is in some in the restoration sanctuaries. And we'll see if that makes a difference in the way the options perform. Um, and so that's my proposal for how we at least try to start getting at that question. Okay, um, great. Uh, thank you for that clarification. Thank you, Commissioner Isla. Commissioner Harrison, and there's a question in the chat from Commissioner Corson and then Commissioner Miller. Yeah, Mike, in, in response to Allison Colden's about sanctuaries and rotational harvest, the stock assessment was going to be a tool in which we could use to develop thresholds and uh, targets uh, in the public fishery, but it also could be used in sanctuaries, as far as my understanding was, that there was a certain amount of oysters that could come out of a sanctuary and yet it could still sustain itself. And so therefore we could do rotational harvest inside of sanctuaries. And if ever a um, NOAA code was overfished, we could open up those areas and harvest those oysters. I mean, that was my thoughts all along. 
So um, just a, a quick response from the perspective of the model, uh, we can open and close harvest anywhere in the model and have that, uh, have that happen. It's easy to do. I think one of Allison's points was over, is something actually a sanctuary if you're going to allow fishing in it? Um, but that's a, a, a name term. Um, and so uh, we can talk about that some more. But as I said, uh, we're going to put together some straw man potential options that explore what happens if rotational harvest is used in certain locations and done in a specific way. And then we'll be looking for your feedback for ways to improve those and make to try and figure out ones that you're more interested in actually looking at. Thank you, Commissioner Harrison. Commissioner Miller. There's also the question in the chat. Thank you very much. I was just struggling to get my uh, mouse to move. Um, Mike, I suspect the analysis of no effect of fishing either way probably frustrates both sides the same amount. <laughs> so congratulations on finding a middle path. Um, but it's a really important conclusion, right? That that either a positive feedback if there was a a, a, a fertilization of the system caused by fishing or negative feedback of, of a decline in habitat caused by fishing would have very different impacts on the dy dynamics that we're gonna see in, in the model. So, so first, I, I think it's important for ev everyone to realize that that's a really critical fi finding. So let me ask you three sort of very simple questions. Um, the first one is, do you think that's an, that's a result of the current abundance of oysters in the bay. The second one is, are there any studies elsewhere of the relationship between um, oyster abundance and the activity of fishing, either negative or po positive? And if there are, are they applicable to inform the model that we're looking at now? So, um... You're you're going to test my memory here, good by asking three questions at once. So I'm going to see how uh, how good I am uh, with this. So um, the I'll do the questions in um, kind of reverse. Uh, and so the first one was: Are there estimates of the effects of fishing on the bottom from other regions? And to my knowledge, they're very limited. Um, the main study that I'm aware of was one that was done in North Carolina, and what they looked at was um, uh, there they had built these tall and small shell piles. So they were about six feet tall, and they were less than, I think they were like 40 feet in diameter or something like that. And the fishing activity basically leveled those out and spread them out which is kind of, it's what you'd expect. You build a sand castle and then you plow something through it and it spreads it out. Um, so that's exactly the sort of thing that, um, that they found. I don't think that, those, uh, that that study is particularly relevant for more natural oyster bars. Um, and the way shell has been deployed in Maryland hasn't been in those high piles like it was for that particular study. Um, the first question it was, is the um, is the or are the results of what we found because of the current state of the bottom? And that's a harder one to answer, but I'm going to speculate on it anyways. The I think historically the effect of fishing was to take oyster reefs that were taller and spread them out. And initially that probably created more habitat. Um, we're not, I don't think over a 25 year time horizon, we're going to be looking at things where a lot of that three dimensionality would be rebuilt 
on its own. We're talking about oyster reefs that took thousands of years to develop up to that form. Um, and so I don't think that is an effect uh, that we'll see. Um, oh, I want to mention one other study that I think is relevant as well. Um, there was another study that used old bathy um, bathymetry maps in Virginia uh, to look at the effect of fishing on uh, one particular oyster bar. And they looked at, I think it was about a hundred year history of fishing. It was a study by Joe Dale Terrace. And um, based on those bathymetry maps, that reef lost about, uh, um, I'm forgetting, how many feet of relief, but it was a substantial amount, but it was, just, it was we're talking a substantial amount over hundred years. And so I'm not sure if the study or the analyses that we did as part of this are sensitive enough to find those small annual increments that, that, they, um, that they saw in that also it was, it was largely concentrated in a period, period where the fishery was much more active than it currently is. We're talking about thousands of sail dredgers out actively pursuing oysters at the time. And um, it's the fishing effects are, I would expect to be more intense than they are now. So if I can put words in, in your mouth, um, you're, you're gonna hold to the fact that the projection interval is short, short enough that really it doesn't matter whether there's a positive or ne negative one because the size of the effect is likely small enough that it wouldn't reveal itself within the time period we're pr 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 projecting forward. I think so. Um, as well as well as I, with the analyses we've been able to do, I don't think there's a big effect, and so. But these small effects can matter, and that's why we're going to try and do some sensitivity analysis around them. Um, it's just that uh, we have tried to include the estimates that we already got in the model, and it was not able to basically recreate the, the past from 1999 to 2020 when we did that. Um, we, it's going to take some more troubleshooting to see exactly why that is, uh, but when we put the, start putting these things that feed back on themselves in the model where doing an activity then makes it better to do that activity in the future and so on, it has the tendency to make the models unstable. And so I think that's what's going on. Um, but uh, we are gonna try a little bit more to see what we might be able to do with that, but I just don't wanna promise something I can't deliver. And, and just one further, I, I just wanna make sure we, we say this all different ways your comment that putting a positive effect of fishing makes the model unstable would also be true, I assume, for a negative effect. It would make it unstable, but that instability would reveal itself as, as local extinction. Yeah, essentially what the model has had trouble doing to date is it can't match the trend we've seen in our oyster abundance estimates or in the harvest patterns by bar if we put in these effects. Um, and so uh, the, the estimates of those effects on average are negative that we get, but the values are small right. and they're fairly uncertain. Uh, so when we put them in though, the, the model says it kind of gives up when it tries to recreate the past. Okay, thank you. Dr. Wilberg, will you please look in the chat and see Commissioner Corson's question? Yeah, and so um, Sean has asked, uh, could the language characterizing the effects of fishing on the bottom be changed to something more specific, like the effects of fishing on spat set or recruitment? Um, and he says his concern is that the current language I've been using implies dredging does not alter relief. Um, so what we're looking at, and so I'm not saying there's no effect of dredging on the bottom, I'm saying that we can't detect an effect of dredging on the amount of shell, uh, nor on future spat set. Those are the two specific things that we looked at. And so I am being as specific as I possibly can when I say those two things. We're looking at, is there an effect of fishing on how much culch that's retrieved in the fall dredge survey changes from one year to the next? So in areas where there's a lot of fishing effort, 
do we see more or less change in cult that's reclaimed or uh, retrieved by the fall dredge survey than there is when there's no fishing in an area. Um, and that's one we yeah, don't. I, I appreciate that. I, and um, I'm not, um, I don't have any issue or I'm not disputing that <clears throat> necessarily. It's just, I'm thinking about when we get to a point that we're trying to describe this to people who aren't a part of the process. And if they just, you know, as we go through the process, if we get too comfortable with sort of shorthand terminology, like, you know, fishing practices have no, no effect on the bottom, uh, you know, that could just be somewhat misleading. Uh, if it, you know, if it were char characterized in shorthand for a public statement. And so if there was a way to, you know, change it to on, uh, number of oysters or amount of shell or, 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 you know, using those specific terms, even though it's a little wordy, um, that might, um, uh, keep us out of some of that, um, uh, trouble with having your results be, um, kind of misunderstood by the, by the public as this thing moves forward. Yeah, that's a fair concern. And I'll try to, uh, stay, uh, technically accurate, uh, with my, with my statements and I apologize if I slip from time to time. I found I'm talking way too much as part of this process. And so each word just gives me one more opportunity to make a mistake. Mike, it's Johnny Shockley. Go ahead, Johnny. Yeah, um, yeah, I have a lot of appreciation for this conversation and, and I feel that as, as well as others, it seems it's extremely important to um, the, to get the messaging correct, you know. And and what um, and we had a long conversation in the meeting and the and the uh, side meeting that I had with you on this. So I, I think I think what it comes down to is if you go to an area that's that's basically silted over or hasn't been worked for some time, and has a small density, um, and go there with a dredge and work it. You're going to get a positive effect um, from what my experience is and many others um, from that effort and from that uh, from that effort. Now, if you go to a, a bar that's that's got a high density load and and uh, and you overwork it, then um, that's going to, that's going to show as a negative impact. But but to say there is no impact and not describe why there is no impact. That's going to be um, very confusing, as, as others have said here. So we we need to dummy it down, I think, with our language and our and our and um and how we describe this thing, and not only because for the general public, but because of this commission. Everyone, there's there's folks out there who know that there are positive effects, um, if done right. And so if if the fisheries managed correctly with different gear types according to the gear type, it can be a sustainable um outcome and and in some cases a very positive outcome so you know it's just it's just not going to be easy um we can't just walk away with this with 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 a with a description saying there is no no difference and that's that's my two cents on it thank you thank you johnny and um i'll see what we can do to to potentially look at those specific ideas in the um in the model. Uh, these things are really tricky, or not in the model, but in the other analyses um, that we've done. Uh, these things are really tricky because there's always a little bit of a chicken and an egg of trying to figure out which one came first. Did fishing come before the oysters or did the oysters come before the fishing? And so it makes it where there's a lot of the data that might not be very useful for answering this question. And in fact, there's a lot of the bars that the fall dredge survey samples that have little to no fishing um, actually happening on them. So uh, despite me saying that they sample over 300 bars a year, uh, that's not to say all of those produce useful information for this kind of study. So, but thank you. And Commissioner Shockley for our final two comments questions, Commissioner Colvin and Commissioner Busick. Thanks, Quinn, and thanks for the opportunity for another question. Um, so obviously this, um, not surprisingly from all the conversations we've already had, um, it's getting a lot of play tonight. Um, I'm sort of wondering how we can uh, 
be proactive and uh, proactive on this issue. One thing that struck me when you were talking, and I can't remember specifically now what spurred my thought on it was related to the types of data that are going into the habitat part and specifically related to the harvest. So I didn't know if there was any concern or issues with the harvest reports that you were getting um, that would cause this type of effect or um, the data sources that were going in so that we as a commission could provide some more specific, maybe not research recommendations, but just recommendations to improve data collection. Um, so, you know, if there were recommendations that you could sort of throw out there uh, based on what you're seeing from the model results that we could vote up or down in terms of um, either QA, QC for the harvest data or, um, you know, something else related to, that would help um, solve this tricky habitat issue in the future. Um, I would certainly welcome that. Yeah, we'll, um, we'll try to put together a list of potential research recommendations. And I, I say this with a little bit of hesitancy because those could be seen as pretty self-serving to some of us working on this as uh, we are researchers. And so research recommendations are something that end up kind of coming back to us. So, uh, but um, obviously it's gonna be the OAC's recommendations in the end. And so we'll, uh, um, we'll uh, work with you to try and make sure that the information we have is clear. We can give you some guidance on where we think the most improvements can be made and and ways that that might be able to happen. Yeah, just some help on the verbiage maybe to make sure it's capturing what you're hearing back from us. But I think um, I, I think we've got a pretty solid indication of interest on this one in particular. Yep. Commissioner Busick. Hey, Mike. This is Keith from Baltimore. Mm -hmm. uh, question, I got a couple questions. You guys are saying that you guys don't have any information on, on the actual impact of dredging and all this that you think you suggest that it might not have a great big impact to dredging. Then why I've been wanting to dredge up in Baltimore because I know that the benefits that it could, it could have that can yield the Baltimore watermen up here. And you guys are saying it doesn't hurt nothing, or it could be a small difference in you know the oyster growth or whatever. But the thing is, you guys have test sites, and they, they you already ran trials on these test sites. But I tell you, for me to dredge up here, you guys would never let it happen. And like I said, there's benefits to it. And I would actually, it wouldn't just be me. There'd be Anne Arundel kids that would actually be interested in doing that up here. But the thing is, you know, DNR, I wouldn't say DNR, I'd say the legislation, it, they're riding the seesaw. They go, oh, yeah, there's benefits. Everybody, is. there's benefits, but we're not going to do it. And I just don't think that's really fair, nothing against you, for you to say it's not a great big impact, you know, when you go to a dredge on, with gear. But then everybody is acting like it's a big impact. So, I mean, to me, I would like you to clarify that. I mean, because, you know, you got activists on here. There's other watermen on here. Basically, we're saying it's a good thing. Then now you're saying it could be, it's not really a big impact. So which one really is it? Yeah, so mm -hmm. I will say that based on the analyses that we did, we did not see improvements on average in the amount of culch or improvements in future spat with power dredging or fishing with any other gear. Similarly, though, on the flip side of that, we didn't see negative effects of it on the amount of culch uh, reclaimed in the fall dredge survey or on the amount of spat set in the year after that fishing activity. What about we the do estim Oh, go ahead. Did you see any difference in like settlement removal on the sites? Like as uh, in like settlement, you know, because up the bay, we have a problem with kind of wingo and all that stuff. Stuff gets, I mean, it's not just settlement, it's line too. I mean, have you seen any difference on that? Like, is it good to say that we're actually are knocking the stuff off and it's helping it? Uh, to my knowledge, we don't have data on that. 
So uh, that wasn't a specific part of our analysis. Um, the, the part about removing sediment is a tricky one. Um, and as I've talked with some of the um, folks who do actually sediment modeling, uh, the suggestion is that on average, the silt comes back down where it was brought up. Um, and so uh, whether there's a long-term benefit from it or whether it's really short-lived is, is tricky. And there probably are um, uh, specifics depending on location and things as to whether or not there is a, a benefit to it. Um, the one other thing I wanted to say about power dredging specifically is that's the main gear where we do see uh, that it's substantially more efficient for harvesting oysters. And so, yes, I, I, when, when I say there's no effect, I'm specifically saying we did not estimate an effect on the amount of culch and we didn't estimate an effect or we didn't estimate a significant effect on spat set. But it is uh, substantially more efficient than the other gears for catching oysters. As uh, I dove up here for oysters up the bay here, I'll tell you what, when, I remit, when I'm on the bottom, I'm stirred up the bottom, we go against the tide due to the fact the settlement is being picked up and thrown behind us. As the tide, and sometimes I'm holding on to the bottom because it's that kind of tide. But that's why I'm asking, you know, has there actually been? Because I know where there's a survey up here. It was a dredge survey up on, uh, I'd have to say, uh, Swan Point area. And I never heard anything about it. You know, it was it was there, it was marked off, and uh, I'm pretty sure it was dredged. But where's the information on that? I mean, I would like to see that information. Um, unfortunately, that was well, not unfortunately, uh, that was some of the information we presented at the small meetings um, from those specific areas that were open to power dredging and then monitored. Um, and they showed about the same results as what um, I showed for the study that was more bay wide of uh, the um, rest. The, the problems that they had with that study where areas were open to power dredging and then trying to monitor them relative to another neighboring site that wasn't, was in most of the locations, um, power dredging wasn't even the dominant fishing gear that was used. Uh, there was also most of the fishing effort was concentrated just in the first year, and there wasn't much effort in the years after that. Um, and so uh, it's hard to draw conclusions, but the estimates end up looking very similar to what we found from the, um, uh, from the other results I showed you today. Would you guys be open to like switching out gear on some of these bars? like having power dredge weeks or months or whatever, and you can always turn it back off. I mean, wouldn't that be all right to do? I mean, if it's not having a great big impact, I mean, why not try something different? Um, I think that that would have to be a broader conversation for the OAC. Um, well, this is the OAC. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just, I thought that was directed to me. So, um, uh, I would say the only other thing I'll add is that the um, uh, we won't be able to model those kind of within season openings and closings for different gears uh, because that's the the model's not set up that way and we won't be able to change it to do that within the time frame we have left for this project. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not something that can be discussed. Right. I mean, because it's just if it's not hurting anything, it's not going to hurt anything to try in my eyes. And it's not just like I said, there's other counties that would even benefit from trying something like that. You know, I'm just saying, you know, put it on the table and let's take and look at it. I mean, it's not something to just turn a blind eye to. Well, there were um, in the uh, in the preliminary results we showed at the May meeting, one of those options was to um, allow power dredging in most of the upper bay. And so that was something that we included in the previous set of options that we ran. And, uh, uh, so, uh, I suspect you will see 
uh, results of options like that again in the future. I, I would like to see something like that because, like I said, you know, it, it's not it, it benefits us a lot. I mean, you got I'm not saying you, but a lot of people want to see Man of War dug up. And here's the thing: Man of War is a good bar. I I could show you there's <laughs> if I have to, I'll go down there with video. I have no problem doing it, and I can show you there's oysters on that. Okay, but if, if you were to open it up for like power dredging or something, breaking it up and all that. I think you would see more of a yield. And I think, you know, us taking shell and just moving it down to bay. I don't think that's a real, real smart thing or a fair thing to do if we're not trying everything first before we go chopping up a bar. There's nothing wrong with it. You know, there's still life on the bar. Why sit there and destroy stuff or, you know, other people's gains or even, you know, just some places need it but the thing is there's other bars to get it from and honestly i like to try other things before we just sit there and dive into something like that mm -hmm. thank uh, you all right thank you mike thank um, you. mike it's robert t can you hear me mike i can i just wanted to check with memo to make sure we still have time for Actually, more we're out of time robert t can you chat uh using the chat with mike <sighs> I just just want I just just wanted to minute just to tell him that over the Swarm Point the test area that we have in uh, Swarm Point, uh, dredging has been planted probably seven eight years ago, and it has not been opened yet. So you don't have no report on what's doing it there. We they were talking about opening. We had the flood of rain, all the freshness we had, and some of the oysters died there. And with all the oysters we had last year in the COVID, it still hasn't been open. But as far as it goes with this. Drudging. Drudging is when you work the bottom, say, take the silt off of it. You can't just take a drudge and drudge, make two passes, and then come back and say, well, it didn't do nothing. You got to work the bottom up. We got 51 sanctuaries. There's only five of them are getting money into them. And those places are just laying there. And they are silting over. They are going down. They're not going up. It's just like a garden. If you plant a garden in your backyard and you plant it, and let it sit there and say, well, you know, I'm going to come back. I'm going to plant it the uh, first part of May, plant with some tomatoes and uh, some cucumbers and stuff. And I'm going to come back uh, after the uh, uh, middle of July and going to have a good uh, uh, crop. You're not going to have nothing. You're going to have weeds. And instead of having weeds out in the bay, we got silt. And it's, silt is very bad and it's covering up a lot of stuff. And you know, we could beat a dead horse to death on this, but we need to have the bottom worked. We got too many places that are not being worked. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Robert T. Um, commissioners, we're going to move on to the next agenda item. Um, Mike is going to give us the charge for the breakout uh, rooms. Because of the nature of the OAC with guests attending from the public and some people using their phones, I'm unable to assign everybody to their groups ahead of time, so I have to do that manually. With that in mind, and given that the previous agenda item went a little bit longer, as soon as Mike gives us the um, charge, I'm going to give give ourselves. I'm going to move the break that was going to be at the end of this agenda item to now, and I'm going to give you a 10 minute break during which you will start receiving invitations to join your breakout groups. Go ahead and do that, and the um, actual conversation. It in, within the breakout groups will start at 7.15, 7.15. Uh, Mike, would you give us the charge? Certainly. So the, the charge for the group is to um, develop a short list of ideas um, that you would like to consider for aquaculture as an option. So what kinds of things could be modified or changed within oyster aquaculture in order to improve uh, the status of oysters for the state. And so um, with this set of options, as aquaculture has not yet uh, been built into the model, we're not sure what we'll be able to model, but still aquaculture has been a topic of interest and has been um, uh, suggested as, a, uh, as an option to uh, improve oysters into the future. And so that's what we would like you to do. So short list, um, start off trying to get maybe three things. If you have more than that, great. If not, um, that's fine too. But uh, think about ways aquaculture could be part of the solution for improving uh, things for oysters. 
As always, a member of your group, you will select to be the scribe slash spokesperson. That person will take notes. And then when we come back to the main room, we'll share those notes verbally with the commissioners. And then they will email those no notes to Quinn or myself so that they can be part of the record. With that, I'm going to take us to a break. And during the break, I will start sending you invitations to join your breakout groups. Nothing. No, this is just the, the, the computer spoke to you. What's the day of today? Otherwise, I'm muted. 
your computer's talking to my face. Oh, Tamara is a paper outage, power outage. Yes, yes. Tomorrow we have a we have three different paper side at the law firm too. Okay, well so I'm I'm Are there any commissioners who have not yet received an invitation to join a breakout room? Voting commission, I mean, commissioners, OAC commissioners. <clears throat> hey, Memo, this is Brian from St. Mary's County. Yes. Uh, I mean, I'm just calling in. I don't have a way to, uh, okay. get, I guess, get an invitation. Let, uh, what, what's the last four digits of, digits of your phone number? What's the last four digits of your phone number? 6827. 6827, okay. I've assigned you to group number one. Any other commissioners not yet uh, in a breakout room? Yeah, Memo, Jeff Harrison. I was on my computer originally, but I lost and I'm now on my phone. What's the last four, four digits? Six Did you get an invitation? Are there any other commissioners, any, any other members of the OAC, not yet um, in the breakout room? Julia Howes, is that Robert Howes? So he's a, a proxy for Commissioner Witt. And this is Jody. Yes, that is. Okay. We signed to a room. We can sign to a room. Thank I you. Did. Yeah. Okay. I took care of it. Memo, this is Simon. It's Johnny, Sh Johnny Shockley, 1635. I'm on the phone. Okay. I just assigned you. And somebody else was talking. Yeah, Memo, this is Simon Dean from Tower County, 3509. I was on the computer and I'm on the phone now, but I'm not sure how it's logged in. I'm here on a computer. Quinn, do you can you see how? Because I can't see it. I was just in phone. I informed we are on a computer or on the internet to do the phone. But I've got no invite. Can you say something so I can see from the Quinn is here. Let me see. Okay, Quinn, can you see what, I don't see a phone number being active. I don't see his phone number. Is it under Rachel, Quinn? Okay, I see Rachel. So that might be, okay, it's Rachel. Okay. Okay, that's done. Anybody else? No, nope, I think we're good. Okay. Hey, Quinn, this is Elizabeth. I uh, sent you a- I saw it. I'm at the okay. station now. Thanks. Thank you. 
I'm muting the various phones as quickly as I can, but I can't get to them all. Quinn, uh, could you monitor occasionally breakout rooms three and four, and I'll monitor one and two? OK.
All the breakout groups are now closing. The participants will be joining the main room. All the breakout rooms are now closed and the participants have returned to the main room. And we will start the reporting with group number one. Who was the spokesperson for group number one? <laughs> I think that might have been us, Scott Kanaki, unless there's another group number one out there. Not your group number one, yes. <laughs> I forget which number I am, sorry. <laughs> All right, well, great. Um, yeah, we had a nice conversation. It started slow and then kind of kept picking up steam as we went through. Um, I think we've met our charge of coming back to the main group here with three alternatives we can model. Um, one was uh, re eliminating or reducing some portion of public fishery, the PFSAs, and having that for uh, available for aquaculture. It's pretty broad, right? But just, you know, I think Mike 
would be able to model something like, like that. Uh, the second would be opening up um, gates bars within sanctuary. So in our group, we're just apparently, and this is something I learned is that the Yates bars within sanctuaries cannot be used for aquaculture currently and opening the Yates bars up within sanctuaries for aquaculture would be another possible modeling alternative. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, modeling the different uh, differences, uh, you know, compared to using wild seed uh, versus spat on shell. Right, and then that kind of led, you know, involved a discussion on what actually is aquaculture and definition of aquaculture, etc. Um, but yeah, modeling that difference between wild seed and spat on shell, um, you know, and just kind of took some tangents. The issues with the lack of shell kept coming up over and over again, um, and I'm not sure how Mike would deal with that in his model, or if that's something that's more or less assumed away. But that was a common thread throughout our conversation. Uh, let's see, it was myself and Dave Sikorsky and Angela Sowers and Simon Dean and, and several others. We had a, we had a nice conversation. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, group number two, if memory serves, Dr. Miller, uh, Dr. Colden, um, Jeff. Uh, who's your spokesperson, group number two? That would be Allison. Yes, that would be me. Um, so we came, up, we came up with a couple of uh, options that we thought could be modeled and a couple that probably could not be modeled. Um, based on a concern about um, a limited amount of shell and the assumption that bottom aquaculture does not produce or retain as much shell as the public fishery, modeling an option with decreased shell availability to restoration in the fishery. Um, the second one was increasing aquaculture acreage. And then the second one was sort of the same, but increasing aquaculture acreage in sanctuaries with decreased populations over time from increasing the aquaculture acreage cap from 10 to 25%. One thing that was interesting in our group was that we talked about doing that outside of named oyster bars, not on named oyster bars. Um, non-modeled options to increase the shucking capacity in Maryland to increase retention of shell and reduce barriers to aquaculture lease approval and increase approval timeliness. Very good, thank you very much. Group number three. Quinn, who was in group number three? <laughs> it's Commissioner Isla, Commissioner okay. Brown, and then um, Commissioner Howes. Very good. Who's the spokesperson? Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, recount our notes from that group. Um, so basically our conversation revolved around two major obstacles for aquaculture. There were, there were technical ones and legal ones. Um, so on the technical end, that was again, as the other two have mentioned, mostly about lack of shell, um, but also lack of larvae. Uh, so the uh, uh, Commissioner Brown, was saying that there are a number of uh, historic or, or you know fossil shell sources that could be utilized for um, getting shell aside from you know manor war shoals because uh, he recognized that that was kind of a hot button issue, um, and then also uh, he expressed there were. Uh, not enough larvae to populate the shells that people had um, and mentioned a hatchery that is coming online soon um, in Cambridge that hopefully can help fill some of that hole but I, I think recommended that you know more more capacity in that regard be uh, be explored um, so as far as modeling is concerned I don't know if that takes the form of uh, uh, you know, just picking numbers and modeling if you had X number of larvae per year, or if it were to build off of the anticipated product production of, um, you know, this, this, you know, facilities in the pipeline, so to speak. Um, and then uh, we talked a bit about uh, the, the legal end of things 
that we I just learned for the first time what Commissioner Kanaki was mentioning about how Yates bars and sanctuaries are just generally off limits to uh, aquaculture applications um, and uh, e whether they have a meter of oyster, or I'm sorry, an oyster per square meter or less like the rest of sanctuaries, they don't seem to be subject to the same rules. Um, and, and then also uh, just the permitting process um, being onerous and time consuming um, and looking for, I don't know if that is something that can be modeled, uh, but that was something that we discussed. Um, so as far as additions to the, to the model, I, I think that's all that we talked about. We also discussed, um, you know, substantively that anything that can, you know, we, the OAC or DNR could do to facilitate more shucking houses in the state to keep more shell here, um, and, uh, it would be helpful. And then more information perhaps being, uh, the refinements that Dr. Wilberg was mentioning for modeling, if more information about sedimentation of bars could be somehow included in those refinements, that that would probably also be helpful. That's it. Thank you very much. And uh, last but not least, group number four. Good evening, everyone. Hey, Mimo. I going to do group four. Okay. Um, starting, um, there was a lot of discussion, obviously, about the ecological benefits of aquaculture and potentially being able to incorporate those into the model, given that uh, now nutrient credits are being generated. And it's another way to generate income for the um, producer, uh, that that would be a potential thing. And it could be used, obviously, those are being used to offset other sources of pollution that's entering the bay. Um, there was a discussion on the TNC uh, aquaculture program that's been uh, particularly successful during the pandemic. Uh, we discussed, as the other groups, we discussed Shell quite a bit. Uh, there was a lot of uh, good input about the ability of um, aquaculture to be done on, on micro shell, in effect, and that this, uh, to get to the point where aquaculture would be sustainable, you know, internally from a shell perspective and whether or not that's the kind of thing that could be um, incorporated. Yep, we have a friend there. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no. Yeah, three of them. <laughs> I got one and it makes enough noise for, for three, so. Okay. keep trying here. Um, discussed uh, kind of as the other groups, co-location of aquaculture operations within sanctuaries. Also discussed uh, reducing administrative overhead head, uh, for aquaculture um, for new sites and potentially pre-identifying uh, areas in the bay that are suitable uh, in advance to sort of facilitate the permit process uh, and also have a maybe more a holistic view of, of the aquaculture. Obviously, we always talk about the three-legged stool of oyster management in Maryland, uh, but to view that, uh, we tend to often kind of look at the each leg by itself as opposed to looking them supporting the, the whole thing. More specifically to the model, one would be uh, there is an increasing use of diploids in aquaculture and how the potential effects of that on uh, the other on the public fishery and restoration areas and whether or not, for example, maybe that would justify incentives for using diploids uh, as opposed to the, uh, the normal triploids. Um, also to, um, and this is um, brought up to model the expansion. Obviously there's an infrastructure needed to support the aquaculture industry from a hatchery perspective. Uh, we talked about uh, shucking houses, processing, et cetera. And, and we really need the infrastructure to meet the, uh, as the demands for uh, aquaculture oysters increase. We have to have the infrastructure to support that. 
and obviously questions of like hatchery capacity, those are things have always been a concern. And also there are potentially external inputs uh, from obviously some of the um, oysters uh, aquaculture, the seed is coming out of state and whether or not, uh, you know, and how to incorporate that type of thing. And then kind of at the end we had, a, it was, I found it interesting. There was a, a sort of a, a question was raised. What if aquaculture was really scaled up at a much, uh, you know, orders of magnitude greater than it is today? What would be the ecological impacts of that and uh, the water quality impacts? And um, so anyway, that uh, wraps it up and I'll send my notes to Quinn. Thank you very much. Would all, will all the spokespersons please email their notes to either myself or to Quinn uh, so that they can be part of the record. And at this time, before we go to agenda item six, Dr. Wilberg, would you be able to address Robert Newberry's comments in two minutes or less? Um, sure. The, the comment is essentially that the uh, stock assessment update that was provided last week um, suggested that there were high numbers of oysters in several uh, parts of the bay um, uh, that were, uh, or that oyster abundance had increased in several parts of the bay and was asking if that was going to be included in the model. Um, right now, it is not. It's our plan to include the information through the most recent updated assessment, though. And so we will have everything as current as we possibly can. Thank you very much. Uh, in light of the time, I'm going to now go to agenda item number six. Dr. North, uh, the floor is yours. very much. Um, if you could please stop uh, sharing your screen. So this, uh, this agenda item is to complete, uh, or not to complete, we'd like to complete if possible, but continue working on rating the non-modeled options. Um, as you recall, the, uh, let me share my screen. Dr. North. Yes. I apologize for interrupting, but your microphone has really bad feedback. Oh, okay. Thank you for letting me know. Let me, You're let me, uh, is this better? This is a yeah. little better. Uh, you might want to turn away your speakers if you can. Okay. Um, hold on up. Let me uh, read this. Uh, is that any better? Oh, yes. Much yes. better. Okay, great. Okay. So we are trying to uh, work more on the non-modeled options. Um, let me share my screen, please. And here we go. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay, great. So at, at our um, April meeting, we were able to get through A, B, and C of the, um, of the questionnaire survey. Uh, well, these are the options that um, will likely not be modeled that OAC members have put forward for managing oysters. Um, so what we're thinking about doing tonight is there's quite a few of them we'd like to get through as many as we can. So any um, option that has a percent agreement less than 60, we're going to ask OAC members if anyone would like to rate that option. And if no one says, they would like to rate that option, we will move on to the next and just consider the, uh, the options uh, rating from the survey as the um, final answer. Uh, so I will start with option C1. Um, and this one received the 35% agreement. And if, just as a reminder, our agreement threshold is 75% for an option to make it to the draft package of recommendations the draft package of recommendations, all the options that make it into the draft package of recommendations will be re-rated. Um, so just to keep that in your mind, um, but this one uh, has a very low chance of getting there. So would anyone like to re-rate this option of using cat shares? Rate and discuss. Elizabeth, it's Mark Breyer. Do you have any more detail for these options? It, it's been a while, so I don't have it right in front of me as to what the option is uh, recommending. Uh, these were, uh, these are, this is language that came out of the breakout group recommendations, a report back. 
So um, I don't have additional detail unless uh, someone who is um, a representative of the breakout group remembers and uh, would like to um, uh, let us know what they thought about cat shares. Hello to the helper. Yeah, we, we were waving back, first of all. <laughs> you, uh, Elizabeth, you could put me as a three. I'm kind of intrigued by this, so I'm willing to look at it. Okay. To Mark's point, I'll just say um, there wasn't enough information here for me to, I, I put myself, I'm running into the difference in the scale between the questionnaire and what's listed here, but um, uh, there just wasn't enough information about what that meant. So I'm not opposed to the concept, but uh, need more information. Uh, what kind of information would you um, like? Well, so I mean, there's a bunch of different ways that you can implement catch shares. Like, uh, is it an ITQ or is it a cooperative type of thing um, on a county by county basis? Um, is there a common pool or is, it, is, there, is there a quota? Like to have a catch share, you need to establish a, a, a high to share. Um, so, you know, uh, there is a lot more questions about how we would actually implement catch shares, what kind of catch shares and what they would look like um, for me to just say, yes, catch shares. Elizabeth, this is uh, Mr. Busick from Baltimore County. I see I don't have a rating on there. I like to rate that as four. Um, is there anyone else who is here and does not have a rating on here? Commissioner Sowers, do you have to rate this? Uh, Elizabeth, Commissioner Corson. Elizabeth, this is John. Uh, it's Johnny Shockley. Have I got a rating on there? I'm on my phone tonight. I'm sorry. You have a rating of one. On catch shares? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So right now the um, percent agreement level is 29% for those on the phone. And uh, we, this we've is, already started yeah. talking. So let's see, let us go through, I think, Quinn, and we'll ask people if they would like to change their rating. And if they can't see their rating, please let it, we can read it off to you. So. Are there any commissioners like to change their rating? Commissioner Bradley isn't present, does not have a rating. Um, Commissioner Sowers and Commissioner Corson are present and they do not have a rating. Hi, I'm here um, for this. I just need a really basic definition of catch shares. Um, so are we talking about an amount then in, that's split between two watermen? Like, just could you uh, give me a little well, bit general? Uh, I think I'm gonna punt to Mike on this because I would say, yeah. I would say catch shares is something where there's a total allowable quota and then it's divided up among uh, people but in very general terms. But Mike, can you um, jump in? I don't think the specifics have been laid out as to how this would be done. The, the questions that Allison said were all very relevant of, um, of that there's lots of ways catch share programs are implemented. Essentially catch shares means that in some way catch is allocated to groups or individuals, um, but uh, all the details of that can make different catch share programs very different. And so I don't believe any of the suggestions that we have had the specific details that would allow a specific definition of what this really means. Dr. North, uh, Commissioner okay. Fithian wants to change his vote from, from two to four. I, I um, this is, this is John Corson. and I, um, I don't recall not, uh, not putting a rating in on any of the ones that came through. So, and just noting that, for example, Chris Judy has a three there and it says non-voting zero. It, it does make me wonder if the, if the spreadsheet is doing what it's supposed to do. Oh, I know. Uh, we have yeah, that right. 
Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm happy to. Yes, it's doing I mean, what it's supposed only... to do. It, the, the spreadsheet is doing what it's supposed to do. But um, I'm, uh, yeah. So in this one, I don't have you down. What could you fill in your rating? So what? Uh, okay. Uh, I, I mean, I, I um, I guess I, I would put in a three. I, you know, it's hard to say because it's such a extremely complex uh, issue uh, to, to, to know exactly what we're talking about with, with catch shares. Hello, Hello. Mark me as a three also. This is Angie. Yeah, this is Scott Kanaki. Just, just, just to chime in real quick. I mean, as Elizabeth and Mike alluded to, it's really com it's a, it's complex and how you would design such a system. But Elizabeth's was pretty, uh, you know, my opinion, pretty accurate as far as you know. First, you have to have something to allocate. You got to divide up um, an amount that you know. There's a total available amount that could be harvested, and it's allocated across different entities, groups, or individuals. There may or may not be some trading. Some of the presumed benefits are that folks have a certain amount of harv that they're able to harvest in a year. They can take their time doing it. They can do the, use the gear that they want to use. The levels and the details, because often there's restrictions on those things still, but the idea is to free up the fishers to harvest when and where to the extent possible, again, and how. Um, and that's, those are some of the benefits, presumably, or the people's you know, purports are. Uh, are realized with a catch share system. Now the drawbacks would be, and this is just me speaking as an economist for the group's you benefit, I hope, <laughs> is um, you know consolidation of, of, of shares, especially in a tradable in a trading system, where a, a small number of folks end up with a lot of shares and there's not as many participants and there's social and economic impacts to communities because of that. Just wanted to share some of my observations real quick. Thank you. Commissioner Music. Yes. Uh when you talk when you talk uh catch shares, now uh, this is what's popping up in my mind right now. The rockfish. Okay, they have um, they 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 got a quota on the rockfish and it's not working. Look, it's about to go in the moratorium. You guys really want to go this way? I mean, I'm just asking a question, that's all. I mean, I don't think it's uh, very desirable and a good idea for anything of this nature to even be talked about. <laughs> we should be ashamed of ourselves, but all right. Well, I, I think, uh, um, David, well, I'm, uh, I'm trying to balance um, hearing from everybody and also the time, and I think we have some issues that are actually close to 75% that we could spend your valuable time on instead of spending time on an issue where you have 30, 29% agreement right now. So um, uh, does anyone have any more quick comments about catch ears or can we move on? So Elizabeth, it's Mark, just to, back to Sean's comment. You upped a lot of these ratings and the percent agreement is actually going down. So something's not right. Yeah, well, uh, one is most acceptable, two is minor reservations, and those get a one for agreement. Three is major reservations, four is not acceptable. So if you don't like something, if you really don't like something, you give it a four. And if you really like something, you give it a one. Gotcha, sorry. The way oh. the agreement goes is ones and twos get a one uh, in this column. Uh, threes and fours get a zero, and that's how um, the percent agreement is calculated. Thank you. Sure. I think we're ready for the next one. Okay, moving on. Um, C2, option C2, develop fishery or aquaculture co-ops with shared equipment and or shared plantings, particularly in areas with low current spat set. Commissioner Busick, you are present. Would you like to provide your rating? We don't see a rating on here for you. I'm gonna provide you a four. Thank you, Commissioner Busick. Are there any other 
commissioners that would like to update their rating? Yeah, I'm a dean here. Um, I changed mine to a four. Thank you, Commissioner Dean. Any other commissioners like to update their rating? Thank you. So it's 52%, Dr. Noor. Okay, well, um, that does not make the agreement special. Then we'll move on to the next. Option C3, use stratified fishing rights with different license types that allow harvest with different gears, similar to crabs. Commissioner Busick, would you like to provide us with a rating? I'm gonna provide you another four. Thank you, Commissioner Busick. Commissioner Sowers and Commissioner Corson, you're present. Will you please provide us with a rating? If you would like. Yes, uh, let's go with a two. Uh, yeah, and I'm open to considering those options as well. So a two is fine. Are there any commissioners that would like to update their rating? I have a question. So Elizabeth, the agreement is only, so even if somebody already ranked it before the meeting, they're not being counted unless they're present? That is correct. Oh, okay. I could change my rating to a two. This is Iliff, Jesse Iliff. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, this is Jesse Iliff. I can't see everybody with when I have when I'm screen sharing. Duly noted. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, uh, the the poll was just draft, and it's uh, as a matter of record, the um, the ratings uh, people have to be present to confirm that their rating is what they um, after discussions and hearing. But people have to say the rating is what they want. Um, Any other commissioners like to update their rating? Okay, um, this did not make the, the threshold and we will move to C4. So option C4, uh, Manage using quotas and in season monitoring. This is Keith Busick. I'm going to give you another four. Thank you, Commissioner Busick. And Commissioner Sowers, Commissioner Corson, would you like to provide a rating? Uh, yeah, I would, I would put a two in on that. Same, same for me. Are there any other commissioners who'd like to update their rating? Okay, I think um, this does not make uh, an agreement threshold. So we'll move on to C5. Um, C5, make annual changes in regulations in response to stock assessment. This initial one has a 65% agreement threshold, but let's go through and get people's um, I'm on, rate. This is Keith Pusick, I'm gonna give you a wall. Well, I actually make that too, sorry about that. Two, okay. Are there any other commissioners out to update their rating? Well, this is close to 75%. Yes, so is there, um, um, yeah. Any commissioners who rate this a three or a four would like to make some changes to the wording of this option. Commissioner Wilkins. Um, this is Commissioner Iliff. I'd be down to change mine to a two just to see how it changes the numbers. <laughs> well, we're getting close. No, you're there. Mr. Cox is not here. Actually, um, is Mr. Uh, 
Is Commissioner um, Lane or Height here? Commissioner Height should be present. Mr. Ruth, uh, Commissioner Ruth, Webster, and Wilkins, and Witt. Commissioner Webster had to get off the line a little early. Commissioner Wilkins may still be here. Commissioner Wilkins is present. Okay, great. So um, for those who rated this as uh, disagree or strongly disagree, we're asking if there's anything that can be done to make this a wording or this idea better for you. And we're talking about making annual changes and regulations in response to the stock assessment. I'm sorry, this is Commissioner Iliff again, and I'll just chime in even though I've already volunteered to change the rating here, but I would just offer that perhaps saying making periodic changes in regulations or maybe changing it from annual because I feel like the management burden and the changes in expectations for folks in the fishery and folks keeping track of the population for a change to regulations every year, I mean, that would be hard. And most folks that I've talked to in any industry, whether it is uh, seafood or construction or anything, having regs change every year is kind of a pain in the neck. And so I think if that time space got changed, that might bring more people to the table. Yeah, this is Jeff Harris. And that's it's actually what we're doing now. We just did it at the last meeting, but uh, I, that's why I have trouble. I mean, even though that's what we're doing now, just the annual, every ch changing every year, I don't know. It just, it just doesn't seem right. I don't know. That's all I could put in there. I'm still going to keep a three though. What's the, what is the timeline for the stock assessment? Is it going to be updated annually or is this just something that's happening because of the process that we have ongoing? That's a question for um, someone at DNR, maybe Chris or Jody. Well, I'll, I'll chime in and uh, anyone can correct me. So yes, our current procedure is to do this annually. Uh, the department has committed to that. And then there is the, uh, uh, the benchmark stock assessment. And Jody, is that every three years or a greater time frame? Every six years. Six, six, okay. So, so we're on course in this administration for annual changes. And I understand the comment. If it said periodic changes, it's made you know less burdensome the way it's worded. If you say periodic, uh, so short answer to your question: We're doing it annually. That's our commitment in this administration. Uh, but every six years is what's mandated. Yeah, I mean, thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. Um, I mean, we're at seventy-five percent now, so I, I don't think it matters to continue to wordsmith this, but. Um, you could also just say make changes in regulations in response to the stock assessment because the stock assessment comes out annually. So if changes are required, then you have annual well, information. Um, just uh, in terms of the, um, I think the procedures of the OAC is that the, it's the voting members that um, the percent agreement um, kind of dictates whether it goes forward to the draft package of recommendations. And the non vote, the total is just to give everybody a, a feeling of where the non voting and, and the whole group is. So, right now, technically, this does not move forward. Commissioner Miller, Commissioner Isla. So, I would just say that in the majority of the fisheries in the mid Atlantic under federal control, most of the time the industry does not want annual changes in rules because they want some stability to know that rules are going to be um, set in place for a certain time so it's not it's annual cha changes that give me concern 
Um, it is, I think you should be looking to respond to a stock assessment, but a commitment to an annual changes may be things that the in, in industry may not like. They'll like it perhaps when it, when it suggests catches should be higher, but they won't like it as much when it suggests catches should be lower and they will, I'm sure, prefer more consistency. And so I, I think baking it in like, like this is, is, is stronger than we in fact want. Thank you, Commissioner Miller, Commissioner Ilef, and Commissioner Dean. So thank you. I just raised my hand um, in response to what Chris Judy was just saying about the legal requirement being every six years, but the current policy being annual. You know, I mean, what about taking a running average of sorts um, in the middle of that at three years and saying, okay, these past three years, there's been this many oysters of, uh, you know, total oysters and oysters of certain classes and trying to average out things like spat set and class years over more than one year, because there's so much environmental variability from year to year. Um, but at the same time, you want a nimble and responsive department that doesn't necessarily need to wait every six years to make a reg change. Uh, so I mean, again, kind of arbitrary to just pick three, but uh, it's just something that I considered and figured I'd throw it out there. Thank you, Commissioner Isla. Commissioner Dean, and then we will move to the next rating. Commissioner Dean. Yeah, um, I'm thinking back about, you know, we're talking about three years ago and the stock assessment. Now I'm rated as a two. I'm gonna be honest with you, at heart, I'm about a four because uh, I'm gonna stick with my two for, for, for now. But uh, you know, we're using a stock assessment. Three years ago, the department came to the industry and said, you know, the stock is down. And we argued, well, the stock is not down. The oysters are there. So we took a cut. And the cut, to me personally, was a 33% cut. Um, we proved that wrong. Last year, we proved that wrong. We know the oysters are there. I think the stock assessment is kind of saying they are there. Yeah, we didn't get our full limit back as far as the potential, um, the proposal. Um, very frustrating. Yeah, we're talking about an annual stock assessment and a yearly change, uh, regulation change, but it's, it's, it's a hard pill to swallow. Thank you, Commissioner Dean. And Commissioner Corson was trying to raise his hand, but couldn't Commissioner Corson? Uh, Commissioner Corson, before you get started, I just wanted to, I just got a message from Commissioner Fithian wants to change his vote to a four, I think. Was this for this one or something else? I'm not sure. Robert Newberry, which which one did he want to change his vote to a four on? Uh, memo it was on the uh, quotas used for management. I think it was two before this. I think it was C3. Okay, so we can ignore that. Thank you. Also, if he, is he not? He's not here, right? He's having computer problems. He didn't get oh. he didn't get him work work till late. He just he just texted me on the phone. Oh, okay. So, um, go ahead, Commissioner Corson. Um, yeah, again, if the hang up is on the make annual changes, uh, I think one might consider changing that to consider changes or evaluate changes. That was kind of the spirit that I assumed we were talking about this in and not literally make a change because, you know, the stock assessment might recommend that you don't make a change. Um, the other thing is we, uh, I believe we've gone back and forth on the voting protocol. Uh, and so I wanna be sure I understand at one point there was a discussion about non-voting members participating in the voting and having a count up until a final recommendation was provided at the end of the process. Uh, and, uh, and, and then obviously there's now been some discussion about voting, but not having it count at any part in the process. So uh, is that written down anywhere? So let me address that. Thank you very much for bringing that up. Uh, as a process during this stage, uh, the non-voting members are allowed to rate. 
but uh, the decision threshold remains the voting members. At the final vote, only and only voting members can vote. Uh, Non-voting members will not even be voting at that one. So they, that's the only distinction between the two um, ways of doing this. Thank you, Memo. And, and it's just a reminder that there's only one vote in the whole process. These are ratings and um, uh, the, the ratings of the non-voting members are important for everyone to see. Uh, so that's, um, you know, and, and it's important for the, everyone to get the whole group, the feel of the whole group of how well, how acceptable each option is. Commissioner Colden, and then we'll move on. Um, I made a suggestion earlier that I thought would be a helpful suggestion. Yes, can you say it again? <laughs> yeah, I just said take annual out. Okay, let's try that. Does that make anyone feel better? So um, if we make this change, so it's not uh, annual, but just general, um, either that also, uh, Commissioner Colden said we could evaluate changes or consider changes in regulations in response to stock assessments. So why don't we say consider? So this is the idea that regulations can be changed in response to the stock assessment, but it doesn't dictate the timing of it, and then it doesn't dictate that it has to happen. Well, that wasn't my edit. My edit. No, that's not your edit. No. I think I would like a, to make changes if the if the stock assessment suggests there needs to be response. With this update to the option, are there any rating updates? Anyone want to change their rating? Thank you, commissioners. We'll move on to the next one. Can someone clarify the proxy situation for Commissioner Fithian for me, please? Um, I don't. I don't believe he has a proxy, and he's not present. So. Um, uh, so the last he, rating that was changed or was going to be changed, we should ignore those comments? Well, it, it wasn't changed. We de facto ignored it because it, uh, I read it too late. So we, uh, we'll, we'll take it from the, here as he's not being present. And does he have a proxy present? No. No. Oh, okay. He doesn't have a proxy. Okay. I don't have him down as an attending on my list. Well, we're getting text messages uh, through uh, a guest, but we're not going to be able to uh, include the future on um, the others one. I guess fortunately I, I missed that one. Okay, so moving on. Option C6, de develop better minimum abundance thresholds and more precautionary target harvest rate reference points. Mr. Busick. I'm gonna give you another four. Oh. I'll do a six. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Busick. Are there any other commissioners like to update their rating from what is currently on the screen? Thank you, we'll move on. Option seven, consider limited entry or other actions to limit effort like attrition. Can we go back to the last one? Is, is, the, is there a certain threshold for us to discuss or not? Uh, if you would like to discuss, you can discuss. Okay. I'm just curious if one of the issues that complicates this one is having both abundance and fishing rate targets together in the same option. And if anyone, I'm just curious, does anyone feel any particular way about an abundance threshold, but not a target harvest rate threshold that if we were to split these into two separate options, there could be a more robust discussion. My, my feeling about this, I would be open, but here's the feeling about it. You don't had, it's, we had, uh, there's plenty of oysters out there, okay? A lot of them boys were doing good, but they couldn't sell them. I don't even want to think about this till we get back to normal, normalcy. That's why I'm giving it a four. I would, I would change my number if at the end you put in sanctuaries. Well, Jeff, there's there's not a harvest target rate target target harvest rate in sanctuaries, though. It can be if you use the stock assessment because 
it, it'll give you a threshold of uh, oysters that you can take from out of it to uh, where it can still sustain itself, if, if I remember right. So, Commissioner Harrison, I disagree with you about that because we're talking about regulation changes here. And the statute that we're working under says that you don't take oysters out of sanctuaries. So, uh, you know, there, there'd have to be a legislative change. It's not, not something that DNR can do by regulation. Maybe we yeah, could. Right. <laughs> um, is, uh, I think, uh, is there any wording of this that uh, could make this I think Alice's question was dividing this into minimum abundance thresholds and then another one, more precautionary targets harvest rates. I think that was the question on the table. And if anyone thinks that uh, changing these, dividing this into two different options would help improve um, their agreement or how they feel about it, um, could you please speak up? I say you just get rid of all of it right there, the whole thing. Well, I think that's what's, uh, we've got 52 and 54 total. I don't think that this is uh, moving forward unless it's split apart into multiple options. My problem with it is, you know, how do we determine these thresholds? I mean, they said it was over harvesting in Broad Creek for three years in a row, and yet now there's more oysters in it than it was before. So. I mean, how do you, where do you get these numbers? I mean, how, how are you going to set a target and a threshold? That's kind of, Jeff, to your point, kind of why I was thinking about splitting this one, because right now our minimum abundance is basically the lowest that we've seen in the stock assessment. And, you know, they reminded us last week that the theory behind that is, if you've seen it before, you know it's not extinction. And I think the one thing is like, we have the opportunity to not let it get that bad. Like if we're not, if we're not able to bring it back, you know, if we let it get all the way down to the lowest we've ever seen before we take any action, are, are you gonna take action quickly enough to bring stuff back? So the, um, Minimum abundance one was the one I thought maybe we could get a little bit closer on. Mr. Dean? Yeah, talking about the minimal abundance and, you know, we're not at the lowest point we've ever been at. I've been an advocate for status quo since day one. If an oysterman goes out and goes to work and cannot make a day's pay, he's not going to, he's not going to go out there and keep doing it. Um, I'm not saying we got to deplete the whole fishery or wipe it out, but we've constantly cut, 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 and cut. The fishery's going up, and we're still cut. That's all we talk about. That's all we talk about is cutting. Commissioner Eiler? Hi, yeah. I, you know, I, I just feel like the minimum abundance question I, I agree with commissioner colden first of all that the this question would be better split into two and we it would be more informative to see how the commission reacts to this question if it were two different questions but i'm surprised i suppose about the claims that the oyster population is robust enough as it is and nothing needs to be modified it seems like what we're working with is kind of an asymptote curve here and maybe we'll never get to totally zero but our legislative mandate says that we are supposed to in, re, produce a report that increases oyster abundance and habitat and not something that says make it so that there's at least one oyster left so i i think that you know, we need to start thinking about how we can improve upon the status quo, not just maintain it. So I think um, here is option 6B, a second option that says, develop better minimum abundance thresholds. So um, Quinn, can we, uh, or 
can we call for a, a re-rating if anyone wants to change their uh, rating based on the new language? Commissioners, based on the updated option, would anyone like to update their rating? Yeah, this is Troy Wilkins. You can make my four now. Thank you, Commissioner Wilkins. Would anyone else like to update? Let's and move there's a forward. comment in the chat from Mr. Judy, Commissioner Judy, with respect that isn't restricted to, by law in the context of this discussion. It's a discussion of future management options, not current. And in the future, there could be a law change if there was 75% agreement and OAC was behind an option. This is what OAC is for, to shape the future, not just say, not just say it. Yeah, say it can be done now. So 6C.6 .6 could apply to sanctuaries if there was 75% agreement. The current law doesn't control the discussion for people who are on the phone. Would any other commissioners like to update their rating or comment? Okay, uh, moving on to C7. Dr. North, this is gonna be the last one. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, well, we'll get through the C's. That's good. Okay. Um, C7, consider limited entry or other actions to limit effort like attrition. I'm going to change this to just like. Commissioner Busick. Can you explain this one to me? Uh, I will try to um, explain. I think limited entry, um, I think the idea is to uh, have a set number of licenses that are, well, let's see, I'm going to ask for Mike, Mike's help, but generally it's uh, having more, um, a limited number of people in the fishery. Okay, that, say, yeah. say no more, give me a four. Okay, you are, Chief. Oh, Mr. Chief. Bisek. No. Commissioner Sikorsky and then Commissioner Harrison. Oops, sorry, thank you. Struggling with mutes and videos and such. Um, you know, what Simon was saying about always cutting, always cutting, always cutting, and then seeing the results of the um, number of surcharges and then harvest this year going, you know, number of surcharges went through the roof. Harvest went much higher than the regulatory controls anticipated it going. Same thing happened last year. Um, I think we all need to realize that a certain variable that controls what's removed and you know, the industry as a whole needs to, needs to be controlled. Otherwise, we're not managing anything. And uh, you know, Simon, you're if I'm not mistaken, um, and any any oysterman, um, your your bushels were cut, but the overall hole went up. The whole harvest went up because so many people are jumping into the fishery. That leaves us with an uncontrollable situation, no matter what. And I just want to say it because it keeps coming up. And we, we keep looking at these things in silos, which is important. And I understand this process. Um, but something's got to change, um, I, I would hope, um, to benefit the industry, to benefit the oyster resource um, you know, into the future. Um, and, I, and I don't think the stock assessment is something that's bad necessarily. We just have to realize how we use it best. And, you know, if we've got to start prioritizing what we want out of this fishery or this industry um, from the industry or, or nothing's going to change. Um, if the population grows, um, you're still capped at your bushels per day and you're capped at numbers of days. So you're capped as, as harvesters as to what you could possibly make. And if that's not enough, something's got to change. Um, so, I, I, you know, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Commissioner Harrison, Commissioner Busick, and then Commissioner Dean. Yeah, after all that talk, I, I want to change mine to a three. And it's just personal. I mean, I've always felt that, you know, everybody has a right to go out there. And anyone that does go out there and catches even one, they, they've worked for it. So 
I just want to change to a three. Thank you, Commissioner Busick. If this is saying what I think it's saying, what you're trying to intend out. I think this is a horrible, horrible idea because ain't the future new watermen, not just us old ones, because people don't get old. And then, yeah, sure, your license go up. What if that young buck can't afford to buy that license? So we just controlled the amount of watermen that's going to be in the future with this right here. And that's why, I, don't, I mean, if you could reword it, <laughs> but it's, not, it's, it's, it's cut it's cut to the point. And I don't know. I just I just can't see it being smart, this whole thing right here. That's just my opinion. I ain't greedy. I, if another waterman wants to come up and do a good job and become a good waterman, you know, able to produce oysters, hey, how about it? Yeah, but that's the name of the game. We ain't out there for a guarantee. This is not communism. This is capitalism. How would you reword it, Commissioner Busick? I mean, you really can't, but that's what I'm saying to you. It's, I don't know. I just think it's a bad idea. There's just no rewarding uh, rewarding it when you're saying you're going to limit, basically you're going to limit the harvesters. But there's other license out there, maybe people that ain't even born yet that might get into this field, and this is what this is saying. We're going to limit them that they can't. That's how I see it right now. I mean, it's just not good. Thank you, Commissioner Dean, and then Commissioner Cover. Yeah, just in response to what Dave is saying, to, to make it sound as though it's uncapped and unregulated, I really think the restrictions we were put in place three years ago are what created this disaster. Um, and I'm not gonna say it was a disaster, but you know, the guy that was catching previous now lost his limit to guys, he left the oyster on the bottom for the season to last longer, for more people to stay in the fishery longer. Um, in no way, shape, or form am I promoting a limited entry. Um, I just think that the management tool that we took is what created the, the negative effect. Thank you, Commissioner Dean. Commissioner Cover. I don't recall giving it a rating of three. Could you change mine to a one? Are there any other commissioners who would like to update their rating? And with that, we're going to put this process to an end for now. We'll bring the rest up at a future meeting. Dr. North, any uh, last minute, last words? Um, well, let's, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I uh, just wanted to do a summary. We go back to our summary table. And um, we had, we had uh, no um, options uh, related to managing the public fishery that uh, are moving forward into draft, the draft package of uh, recommendations. So um, we we did well tonight. Thank you all very much for your um, your uh, thoughts and uh, frank discussions. And I will be uh, taking um, up the rest of the non-model options at a future meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris Judy uh, is going to make a very quick announcement. Chris? Yes, thank you. Uh, so this is a, a reminder uh, for those who attended the June 8th meeting. Uh, this was announced that the department is accepting feedback on the 2021-22 proposed oyster harvest limits. And that comment period uh, ends June 18th. So we need your comments by the 18th. And uh, there is a website you can enter your comments at. That's on the screen. If you can't see because you're on a phone, uh, we can easily send, well, Quinn will send an email uh, with this information. So uh, the comment period is open and you can submit your comments and we look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and with that, we turn it back to Quinn for public comments. The next business order is public comment. Public comments are limited to two minutes per speaker. Public comments longer than two minutes will need to be submitted in writing. Uh, you have Quinn. a public comment? 
please raise your hand or place in the chat. Commissioner Brown, you got a comment question? Yeah, yeah. no, I just want to put one comment on there with uh, Dave Swarovski and his comment he had on how we would like being uncontrolled over uh, our oyster harvest and stuff. The only reason we caught as many oysters as we did last year with working less days, less limit, is because the oysters are doing so well and we have so many back there. I don't want to hear no more of this about we're not regulating ourselves. We are regulated more than any other industry that there is. Thank you. Can I, can I clarify something here? Because I see uh, an all caps comment in the chat as well. I'm not talking about the industry not being regulated. I'm talking about for the last two seasons, a goal was set to reduce harvest. That goal was not met. Therefore, the controls which are put in place are not achieving the outcome which was prescribed. That's it. That's a fact. And you're completely wrong because it's more and more product no. out there. No, I'm That's not the reason why. When you got more and more oysters, you don't, and it's not no that many more. It was a lot of people bought their uh, oyster surcharge and didn't go oystering. It was because they were fearful that if they didn't renew it, that they would lose the right to for, to have that oyster surcharge, so they could go oystering. Thank you very much. Yes, they are, were very fearful they would lose their surcharge because of proposed legislation last session. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner Thank Brown. You, Thank you, Commissioner Sikorsky. Commissioner Wilkins, did you have a comment question before I go to public comment? Yeah, I had a, I had a question for, for Chris. Um, the comments that we made last week, does that go into the comment or do I need to send it? send in what I said on here. Oh, it, yes, anything, any, anything said at the last meeting, uh, the eighth, when we had everyone provide input, that is on record, we have that. You certainly can send in your comments if you feel like you would like to do that more formally at the website, but uh, what you said before is fine, that counts, that's good to go. Commissioner Busick? I was just ask. I was gonna ask a question about the whole uh, agriculture idea that everybody was throwing around because in the other room. But uh, no, I'll, I'll ask it. Agriculture. When we go to agriculture, when we put stuff in agriculture, doesn't that mean we can't harvest on it? You no, know, just a idea. I mean, that's not restricting what if we agriculture something we can't touch it. Correct. You understand what I'm saying to you? Yes. Who would like to? That was from the breakout rooms. Yeah. Would you like to answer that question for Commissioner. Because I, I don't want to throw an idea out there because I'm open for agriculture, but I just don't want to throw an idea up there that, okay, now we're going to lose a whole bunch of land, the oyster, you know, oyster land, because we don't have any as it is right now. I just want to make that. Uh, is it, I don't know if I'm asking right or saying it right, because someone was concerned about that. That uh, in the comments, you know, that we would lose land, and uh, you know that's, that's that's clear to air. We're not here to make an you know a judge on losing property, oyster property, because we're trying to give property for the agriculture. Yeah, I don't want to throw. Yeah, I'm not trying to. I don't know. I just think. I, I don't, we got we got to really discuss that agriculture stuff because I that's real real uh questions in there. That's all. We got a lot mm -hmm. of questions in agriculture questions. Thank you, Commissioner Music, Commissioner Dean. Well, I, has anybody gonna answer his question? I mean, I can answer his question if no one from DNR is gonna answer his question. Go ahead, Allison. Okay, Keith. So related to aquaculture, where someone has an aquaculture lease, it's true. You cannot public harvest on aquaculture leases. Aquaculture leases, though, are also restricted in places where they can be put. So aquaculture leases can't be on a PSFA, public shellfish fishery area, and they can't go on a Yates bar, either inside or outside a sanctuary. Um, they can um, petition to declassify public shellfish fishery bottom 
um, if there's less than one oyster per square meter there, but otherwise they cannot go on areas that are Yates bars or areas that are PSFAs. Um, but once that it is in a lease, it is true that you are not allowed to harvest uh, from the public fishery off of that area. Okay, that answers my question because I just don't want to sit there and agree with doing all this, you know, because I believe that we could do some agriculture in some places maybe, but I don't want to lose, you know, public fishery areas because of an idea, you know what I mean? So thank that's you, all. Commissioner Music, and thank you, Commissioner Calden. Commissioner Dean? Yeah, real quick, on, on the June 8th meeting, um, I did not have the option to uh, come in on a computer, log in, I had to call in, um, at which point you were asking for public comment or commissioner's comment. I'm not sure how it worked, but I guess all the phones happen to be muted. Um, I wasn't able to provide my comment. And I understand we can go online and do it, but I'd like to go on record as I believe we should go back to our 15 bushel limits five days a week and have the upper bay back return back open. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Dean. For public comment, Mr. Newberry. Can you hear me, Quinn? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, first, I want to comment on the aquaculture to begin with. Um, you know, I did see in that one breakout group where they were considering possibly getting into oyster bars that are the Yates bars and all. But, um, you know, I do remember the testimonies back in 2010 and 12 where people that represented the aquaculture industry stated that they don't need to go into, you know, areas where the commercial harvest is they don't need sanctuaries all they need is big open space to do their oysters so i know times have changed and money's gotten funny so but that's just one thing to consider um on the quota i'm glad to see that the uh, I, uh the catch shares and all didn't is not going to move forward because that that really can't be applied to the uh, oyster industry i mean it it was it was forced on us in the fishing industry we had no options other than what we were told to take by the prior administration and it's you know it's kind of a a problem for everybody. Uh, I mean, they're still catching plenty of fish. And then as far as, as what Mr. Sikorsky said, I mean, to say that a fishery, you know, that we went over this target that we had and all that, take into consideration, David, that we only averaged uh, two and a half days a week of harvest this year. And they were catching their limits from the day they started till the day they stopped. It was the worst year that we ever had on record. If you probably put in the factor that we didn't have the pandemic, and we did not have the limited market, we probably would have been well over 500,000 bushel this year. So if you're looking for a 26%, uh, 330,000 over 500,000, maybe even 600,000 bushels, that's almost a 50% savings what we could have caught. So I, I don't think that, and, and to make the comment, I'm sorry, you did make it that it's uncontrollable. Uh, with the information that you have on the oysters, um, would you be willing to take a limited entry on recreational fishing being that something that is uncontrollable is the accountability on what they're catching, exactly what you said about oysters. So um, I'm just throwing that out there. I mean, if you want to talk about, you know, you know, make, you know doing something, how, how about that with a recreational fishery? So I end my comments. And I would like to respond because I see the, the, the comparison there is perfect. It's the duty of the, of the agency to manage within the targets and thresholds of a fishery. And where they fail, action should be taken to better manage a fishery. Period. The end. And I don't doubt the discount, or I don't discount the disconnect that the data-driven stock assessment has with reality. And it would be nice to see the data-driven stock assessment and the industry experience come together and at some point in the future, so that we can all rely upon the stock assessment in a meaningful way, the way it's done in you know the scallop fishery, for example, where the industry is thriving and. I know oysters aren't scallops and oysters aren't rockfish, but it all comes down to the industry, the industries or, or the participants in fisheries working with the agency and the agency actually implementing some tools that work. And I know it's tough. It's not a, I'm not attacking DNR, um, but we need to focus on what we need to do to improve our fisheries. And uh, I think, you know, I've been a number one advocate for recreational accountability, which is better said as accounting for recreational catch and act in a proactive way. I think I first talked about that at the Sport Fish Advisory Commission in about 2011, and I've seen very little progress done by the state or the feds to improve our understanding of these important stocks like striped bass. So, thank you. Thank you, Captain Newberry. Thank you, Commissioner Sikorsky. Are there any other public comments? 
Uh, Quinn, can I just can I just have a a a, a, a come back on that one real quick? Be real fast. Um, I understand what David is saying, but the thing is, when you talk about the industry being involved, I think that the oyster industry has been working better with this administration over the past seven seven years than we had before. I mean, we actually have a seat at the table. Uh, we we agree to disagree politely for a change. Uh, I know there's some changes that. Uh, need to be made that the watermen want that, you know, we might not get, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking for this year, you know, there's got to be light at the end of the tunnel, but to, to say that, you know, it's like, we're doing a bad thing. These, the watermen, we're not, I mean, you know, look what we do. We do restoration effort, which is better than anybody else does. And that's a proven fact. Uh, we're sustainable. We're, we're, we're creating our own sustainable fishery here. So to make that comment that, you know, when things get out of control, that there needs to be more regulations, uh, Robert T hit it right on the nose. I mean, this oyster industry is regulated, policed, you know, uh, more than anything else I've ever seen in the state. So thank you very much. And I'm out. Thank, thank you. And are there, Queen, are there any other public comments? No public comments. And Commissioner uh, Colden well, has her hand up. Commissioner Colden. I, I just want to better understand this completely honestly, not to beat this dead horse, um, but I, I just don't understand the argument. So, so relative to 2018, bushel limits were cut and days were cut. So if people were limiting out, meaning they caught their bushel limit, they came home, they fished four days a week, uh, and you have the same number of licenses, then the harvest should go down because you have the same number of licenses, but you have reduced bushel limits and you have reduced number of days per week. So what I think Dave was trying to say before was there's more people coming into the fishery and that's the reason that the harvest increased. And I think both uh, Robert T and Rob Newberry pushed back and said that wasn't the case. So I'm just trying to understand what happened here because to me that's the only thing that could happen unless people are harvesting too many bushels. Quinn, can I can I respond? Can I respond to that, please? I'd like to respond to that. I mean, here here's a simple fact, fact, Alice, and you got to understand this. You know, a lot of these guys have oystered for 50 years of their life. Usually after January, <clears throat> a lot of guys leave and go perch fishing because the uh, abundance in oysters has been depleted. From opening day to the last day, people were catching their limits and not working a whole day. So their effort, as fact, is their carbon footprint was less. That is because of the amount of oysters that were there. I mean, I went out on boats several times this year. I saw, I mean, you wait to see next year. I mean, I'm tired of the doom and gloom here. Next year, there's going to be more oysters available because of the amount of the smalls. They're up every place that we're working, smalls are off the chart. So to say that, you know, someone's catching too many bushels, no. Everybody that went was catching their limit from opening day to end day, which means more oysters in the water that were there available to harvest, and they've left that many more in the water. So, I mean, next year, is it going to be the same thing again? So it's simple supply and demand. There's more oysters. Everybody was catching them from opening day to closing day. And the fact of saying that, you know, somebody could be, you know, stealing oysters or, or too many bushels, that, that's, that's nuts. It's crazy. I'm sorry. Well, right. So that's not what I said, because I said that would be the only way to do it in the way that you were saying. So what you just showed was, yes, there was an increase in the effort in the fishery, and it was based on both more people coming into the fishery and increased time in the fishery. So thank you for clarifying that. That's less time in the Quinn. fishery. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'll tell you what. Quinn, Quinn, Robert public T. comments has Quinn. ended. Um, Quinn, Robert T., one second. Uh, you, you know, it just stands to reason the amount of or y'all don't realize the amount of oysters that we've got out in the bay. I mean, you go out there and you go to work and you catch it. I was leaving bars where I could catch my limit at 1030, leave there and go to another one where I could catch them by nine. I mean, it is that many oysters out there. And we got more small oysters went back last year and towards the end of the season, we couldn't even sell a three inch oyster. They wanted them three and a half and four inches. So we had to look around and find them. I worked uh, most time I stopped by the week for Christmas. I worked until about the second week in January, only working a couple of days a week. And I stopped and I came home and I went fishing. 
but the amount of oysters. I tell you, I'm going to invite both of you, Dave and Allison, to come and go on the boat with me one day so you can see what's out there. You can't see it unless you go out to where it is. You're both invited. Uh, when the season comes in, I will talk to you all. I'll be glad to have you on the boat. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. There is no further business. There are no objection. The meeting will be adjourned. Thank you, everyone. We will post the recording of this meeting as soon as it's available on the department's website. Have a great rest of the evening and see you in the July meeting.